Good morning, everyone. You'll notice um, down at the bottom of the screen is the translation. Uh, and I'm hoping this will work for us for this entire presentation. I'll talk fairly slowly so that one, it can keep up with my um, presentation and you have an opportunity to read uh, as I'm talking. Uh, so you get the translation and the the written word as well. So I'm really excited to spend the next two hours with you and to talk a little bit about uh, our program, my work and uh, the experiences that I've had um, with children in the out of doors. I call this presentation in some ways kind of where the sidewalk ends that's where the true discoveries begin. And if we think about a sidewalk and a street, when you step off the sidewalk, um, that's really where you start to discover um, the natural world and the world of excitement and interest for uh, young students. So um, in my introduction um, two days ago, three days ago, I talked about uh, growing up in Australia. This was my uh, schoolhouse and there I am. I'm the center sitting uh, with my three brothers. There are a number of brothers that are not with us because I was the youngest of seven. There I am on the back of um, the horse uh, enjoying being outside. So when I was born, um, I grew up on a sheep station in northwest New South Wales in Australia. Um, and uh, we had about three and a half thousand acres of land. And that 3,000 acres was my playground. It was my informer of my life. It was my mentor. It was my teacher. It was my entire experience. I, being the youngest and the youngest by a number of years, my elder brothers would spend most of their days out working um, with my father, which left me to my own devices. And my mother, um, who also had work to do on the farm, would kick me outdoors and I would then roam the hills, the creeks and the valleys of our property by myself as a two year old. My father bought me a horse when I was about two and a half. So my companion was a horse of which I had no saddle, no bridle, just the horse. And I would use a stump to climb onto his back and um, roam the hillsides at the age of three. Now, nowadays, to even think about putting on a child, I can't hear you, Sandra. not getting any voice now it's okay you can hear yes okay just talk a bit slowly okay okay thank you um nowadays uh if you think about putting a child on a horse and allowing them to roam free uh for miles by themselves would be unheard of but growing up um that was my that was my teacher and as you know in australia there are many deadly animals snakes spiders uh, scorpions not to mention uh, deep creeks and valleys that any of those items could have hurt me at some time but i survived all that and later in life when i became an adult this understanding of my um, development and my growth in the wilderness really made me realize how informative nature was to who I am as a human being today. Nature was my grounder. It was my teacher. Uh, it, it informed every part of my life. This is the creek in my um, property back in Australia. So, and this is the valley that uh, I grew up in. 
And as you can see, it is a extremely wide expanse. So when you think about the child, you have to think about the child in a number of different ways. The first is this idea of our environment shapes us. It develops who we are. And the larger the environment the child has an experience in, the more the child is developed as a human being. A narrow environment, a limited environment, limits that child's scope in life. This connection to nature also came to me in another realization. When I graduated university, I came to the United States and I was given a job. I got a job teaching um, 16 year old boys in the wilderness for eight weeks. Um, these young men were um, urban students. And when I first encountered them, I realized that their connection to the world around them was very limited. They understood how life worked. They understood how to navigate in a city, but to survive in nature and to connect to nature was rather limiting to them. So I had to work out how do I connect these kids in a very uh, a strong way to the environment. So I taught them sailing. Now, you may think, what is sailing to do with that connection to the environment? If you think about sailing on a sailboat, there, there are no signs that tell you this is the way you sail or go in this direction. You have to intuitively understand the wind, intuitively understand the direction of the wind. You have to observe the ripples on the water. You have to observe your boat. You have to understand your body, the weight of your body. Each time you shift your body, you change the direction of the sail. So if I move too quickly, then the boat will lilt too quickly and I will lose power. You have to understand with your hand when you pull in the sail, you have to understand the connection of your hand and the feel of the weight of the wind upon the sail. Now, when I put these young lads in a sailboat, of course, at the beginning, they were just going in circles and they were falling over. The, the boat was tipping and capsizing. They had no connection. And slowly, as they continued to experience being on a sailboat and sailing, they started to understand the feel of the wind on the side of their face, the, the movement of their body within the boat, to understand which direction the wind would come. And ultimately, they never didn't have to think about those things. They became intuitive. Their connection to the environment around them, that sailing, the wind, the ripples on the water, became what's called the biophilia hypothesis. And that is, Biophilia is the innate or the direct connection of us to the environment. And you may have remembered the movie, The Avatar. Those people in that movie were very connected to their environment. And this is the goal we have with our students. The goal is to connect them intuitively to nature so that they are comfortable with nature, they feel nature is important, and that it has a value to them as a person. They understand the life or the growth or the being of nature, a little seed that it grows, it grows into a tree or it grows into a plant, a flower, the connection of the bee to the flower, Understanding by connecting to nature is what we call the biophilia hypothesis. My growing up in Australia as a small child being put into an environment that 
that environment was my was taught me to connect in a very powerful way. I would remember as a child running through long grass. And then all of a sudden stopping. And there right in front of me was one of those deadly snakes. Now, my visual senses didn't necessarily see the snake to make me stop. My biophilia senses, my entire body using all of its senses stopped me. I would then see the snake using my visual sense. And then I would back away. So I became so connected to my environment. And this is what we need to do with children. You may ask the question, how will this help our children in the future? This connection to nature, this biophilia hypothesis. How will that help them as an adult? To put it in very simple terms, what we don't love, we will not grow up to care about. What we love, we will grow up to care about. Or what we know and connect to, we will grow up to safeguard. So the importance of nature is for all of us to be able to have that environment not only for our generations, but for generations to come. So when you're looking at our children that are coming to you each day into your classrooms, we have to think also about the environment that they come from. Some of your students will have a connection to nature. They either have a wonderful backyard with lots of plow flowers and birds and life in their neighborhood. They will have a park that maybe has a stream and they will visit that. But you also will have students that live in a housing block, an apartment on the 14th floor with no connection to nature other than maybe a few plants on the balcony. Or maybe it's the connection between their apartment building and getting to school through a neighborhood. But as you know, Many of our neighborhoods are concrete jungles. They're full of concrete and nature just peers above the surface as a dandelion. Maybe they see a pigeon or a bird each day, but that is quite limited. So as teachers, as adults, as parents, we have to look beyond our school to where our children are coming from and then move them into an environment that is more natural and that they can connect to. So if you think about this idea of the child and the child who we're trying to connect a sense of place, sense of space is really important. What makes a special place is the way it buries itself inside the heart, not whether it's flat or rugged, wet or arid, warm or cold, wild or tame. Every place, like every person, is elevated by the love and respect shown towards it and by the way in which its bounty is received. I think about the child in the term of terroir, now, terroir is a French word meaning land. So like a grapevine, for example, and you're all Italian and you love your wonderful wines and you make some of the best wines in the world. But if you think about the child in respect to the, the grapevine, when I drink a glass of wine, it's not just a glass of wine. It's every essence that goes into making that glass of wine from the soil and the nutrients in the soil to the lightning that builds the energies in the soil, the rain that comes down and feeds the soil with oxygen. And that wonderful grapevine then grows and produces beautiful grapes 
to the vintner who picks those grapes with gentleness and takes them to the 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 winery and presses them and then blends those juices to create a wine and then that wine is then stored to perfection and then ultimately i get to taste that wine this is like the child everything that we put into the child every experience that they have every connection they have builds who that child is and if we take the child out of the natural world and just put them in the human space then we are depriving them of an entire connection to both their human history and also the world that we're trying to put them in. So the characteristics of the child we need to consider when we're thinking about their connection to nature. So the characteristics of a child is they have spontaneous interest and deep concentration. So they are interested in everything from the very youngest child through as they get older. Unfortunately, as they get older, their interest starts to wane. And the reason their interest starts to wane is because as they get older, they're looking for bigger and more exciting things. They want to take more risks. They want to see how far their body can take them. So even older student, students have spontaneous interest and deep concentration. It is up to us as an adult to put that environment in front of them. They have a desire for purposeful movement all through the ages, starting with the youngest child whose purposeful movement is to put everything in the environment into their mouth. I put the environment in my mouth. They are very oral. To the three, four and five year olds who want to move from space to space, who need to use their body for gross motor and fine motor experiences. To the older students who want to climb trees, who want to jump off logs, who want to run through the meadow, to even older students who want to climb up cliffs, who want to go on long, arduous hikes, who are desired for purposeful movement. Students love repetition, especially young people love repetition. So don't be afraid to repeat things. Each time a child goes into the environment, they are seeing the environment with new eyes, new experiences, new desires, and new objectives. So if they have only been once, that's limiting. The second time, they'll see a different. The third time, they'll see a different. Ultimately, they start to notice the small, minute details because that repetition allows them to go deeper and deeper into the environment that they experience. So the love of repetition, the love of going back to familiar places helps them delve deeper into those experiences. They have a love of order and nature is the perfect environment to supply them with order. Trees don't run around. They are stationary. Grass is stationary. The birds will be there. The deer will be out in the meadow. The cricket will still be in the long grass. That connection to a nature, an environment that stays the same, gives them a sense of order. It's this idea of a sense of repetitiveness that I can go each time and it's going to be the same so I can be comfortable. A child who is scared of nature is a child that has been put in nature in disorder or chaos where they didn't have the repetitiveness or the sense of order.
is a desire for freedom of choice. This is critical in a child's development of the love of nature. As a young child growing up in Australia, when I was outside, I had the freedom to choose wherever I wanted to go. And my life, my, my play would be my own construct. I would build it. When you take children into the environment, into nature, they need to have that freedom of choice to be able to discover for themselves, not directed by an adult, but discover for themselves and the freedom to explore, to stop for as long as they want to examine a worm. Or to go as quick through an environment on a running spree or to roll down a hill in the in the way that they want to from the highest point or just even if it's just the lowest point and it's only a couple of yards. It's their desire for freedom of choice. They have a preference of work to play. This may be a new concept for me, thinking that children want to play before they want to work. Work should be in the same realm as play, that they should enjoy work and desire work as much as they desire play. Work should fulfill for them the desire that they need. I'm going to repeat that the work that the child does should fulfill for them the desire that they need. They should have an interest in the work. They should have a desire to go further in the work. And that's the both the work in school and the work that they have at home. As long as it is purposeful work and not just work to keep them busy. Purposeful work is really important. They have an indifference to rewards and punishment. The research is clear that children don't are not motivated by rewards or punishment. What they are motivated by are all the things that I talked about. This this idea that the work is something that engages them. They have freedom of choice to be able to choose what they want to do. Order is there, predictability is there. They are in control, not in control of you, but in control of themselves. And this, this creates this indifference to rewards and punishment. Children love silence. And in the modern world, we find it very difficult to find spaces for silence. Nature is the perfect place for science. It gives the child the sensorial inputs that they need without the clutter of noise. The clutter of noise destroys a child's sense of connection. And the modern world is all about clutter and noise. Finding silence is really important. A sense of personal dignity. Who am I as a human being? I need to have control over myself. I don't need to be controlled. In other words, told what to do all the time. I need to be able to control myself. This is called freedom within discipline. Freedom within discipline. What that means is the child can be free, but they also need to be disciplined. And disciplined comes from the Latin to teach. So they can't just go crazy, run about, run about and destroy things. Because by teaching them, when you affect something of somebody else's, you hurt somebody else. So this idea that they are in control of themselves, but nobody else. That they 
have what they need to be able to grow to be a wonderful human being, but they don't impart that on somebody else. Building a sense of personal dignity and that freedom of choice goes a long way to do that. Spontaneous self-discipline, being able to control themselves, being able to calm themselves. And we're going to get into that a little bit later on as well. But this idea, this sense of personal dig dignity sponsors and supports this some spontaneous self-discipline. And then ultimately, all of this is the interest in the cosmos and the interrelationship of all things. The interest in the whole world around them and, and the stars and the planets and, and nature and how humans and nature interact, how the animals interact, how plants and bees interact. Interest in how the world works and how it all interrelates is really important for the child. So this list is a, a simple list of basic characteristics of who the child is. But so many of these things are taken away from the child. Because we as adults feel the need to control. And the reality is that when we control a child, we rob them of their ability to grow up as an independent, self-assured, incredible human being. So these, these characteristics are really important. When you think about a child, I'll tell you a very quick story. It, it's based here in the United States, but there was a young man and he graduated out of university uh, with a law degree. And he wanted to give back to his neighborhood. He wanted to, he felt, I have all this experience. I want to give back to my neighborhood. And the neighborhood he grew up in was very depressed. In other words, it was very poor. Uh, many people out of work. Uh, many stores were closed. The streets were unkept. A very depressed neighborhood in New Jersey in the United States. So he asked around and he asked a friend and this friend told him to go and see a woman in this neighborhood and she could get him to work to support the neighborhood. So he went and knocked on this woman's door and she answered the door and she said, can I help you? He said, yes, my name is Corey and um, I would like to help the people in this environment. I just graduated with a law degree and I have a lot to share. So the woman looked at Corey and said, come with me. They went downstairs and out onto the street. And when they were on the street, she said, Corey, look around and tell me what you see. And Corey looked around and he said, I see a lot of young people on the street corners with nothing to do, no work, no future. I see shops boarded up. I see roads in disrepair. I see a community that is in desperate need, but have nothing. And the woman said, then you are of no value to me. You are of no value to me. And walked away. And Corey stopped her and said, what what do you mean? I have no value. I, I, I have no value. I have a law degree. I can help. She turned to him and said. You only see what is in front of you. You do not see the potential. And this this idea of only seeing what is in front of me and not seeing the potential of a child or the potential of an environment that we are in struck me as being critical when thinking about 
how to connect children to the environment. Not all of us have tracts of land at our doorstep that we can send children out into nature to have that incredible connection. Many of us live in urban environments and we don't have that connection. And we immediately say, I'm not connected to nature, so I can't do anything with the children. That's what Corey's view was. He could only see the negative of the environment. But the lady said, you need to look beyond exactly what's in front of your eyes and start to look for potential, to look for those little things that you can start to introduce your children to. The dandelion between the pavement, the garden on the neighbor's house, the tree down the block, the bird that sits at your front step and you feed grain to. Every environment in the world has nature in it. But sometimes we have to look beyond what is in front of us to see that environment, that new nature that we can then introduce to our children. So looking beyond, not what's just in front of you. So when we think about education, and this is a really important topic around the world, educators everywhere are studying all different kinds of things about how children learn. I think it's pretty simple. For me, education is experience. The more experiences that I can give a child, the better the child will be. Lots and lots of experiences. The second thing that is really important in education is experience. As I said, the more experiences that we open for our children, we allow them to, to delve into experiences in nature, experiences in the urban environment, experiences in literature, experiences in science, experience in mathematics, experiences in art, experiences in theater. All these experiences go to allow our children to grow to be the adults they want to be. I have a great belief, and it is a core belief of mine. I believe that every single child on the planet, every single one, is the greatest, the in most greatest in the world at something. But very few children get to experience what they are great at because their experiences are limited from the moment they are born. You can think of people in your realm who are really incredible at something, but if they never experienced that thing that they're really good at, would we know who they are? Would we know them to be great at that? Or would they be just normal? Very few people get to experience what they're great at because life keeps limiting. So this idea of more experiences allows our children to discover their true greatness, the thing that is deep inside them that wants to be released and come out, the thing that says, this is who I am, this is who I want to be, this is, is who I will become. That all comes from experience. So I think also in regards to this idea of, of, of when they label in education, the academic child. So let's take the academic child and emplace it with a sense of discovery, that everything that we teach the child has to be laid out for them to discover. I can turn around and tell children the names of 10 trees, 
and it will go in one ear and out the other. It will mean nothing. But if I have them discover the names of the trees themselves by looking it up in a tree guide or going and just looking at the differences between different trees, they're discovering that for themselves. You are sparking their sense of discovery, their sense of wanting to know. It's very important. You need to spark their sense of wanting to know, and then you don't have to teach. They will teach themselves. So the academic child is a sense of discovery. The social and emotional child is the sense of wonder. Everything the child should be doing, the child should go, oh, that is wonderful. That is amazing. It needs to spark their inner core, their entire body to be involved in what they're discovering. But everything that they discover, their entire senses come together to feed them the information that they need. The senses are what we feed our what we feed information to our children. They say, never give the brain more than you can give the hand to hold. Never, never give the give brain the, never. more than you can give the hand to hold. So this social emotional child is the sense of wonder. The physical child is the sense of adventure, that every discovery has to be an adventure. The answer is not the first thing that they see. The answer has to be discovered, and they have to go on an adventure to discover that answer. And that adventure may take them weeks before they discover the answer, or it may take them 10 minutes to discover the answer. But if I tell them the answer, the sense of adventure is completely removed. And no longer is the child having an adventure, they're just getting information. And information is okay, but that adventure connects information to them personally. So this sense of adventure is really important. So the physical child, the academic child, sense of discovery. Social emotional child, sense of wonder. And the physical child, the sense of adventure. I think a lot about children when I watch them in nature and I see them in the classroom and I see their behaviors and how they interact with each other how they interact with their environment, how they interact with the adults. And I started to think about this idea of why is behavior, why is there negative behavior in a child? Why do we look at some children as being naughty? Montessori said children are not naughty by nature. We create naughty children. So I started to think about this idea of the anthropological child. That is, where does our child come from in, anth in anthropological times, in ancient times? What is the need that they are trying to fulfill? For example, humans. We evolved as hunters and gatherers. So our body has a need for movement. We needed to hunt. We needed to gather. Our body needed to move. So anthropologically, children have a need to move. That's built in. We can't prevent that. We can't remove that. That's there. What we have to do is we have to accept it and then celebrate it by allowing the movement of the child. When you look at behavior in your children, 
don't immediately look and say, oh, that child's naughty because of X. They're naughty because they're trying to get a need. And a lot of the needs that children need are anthropological. So if you think about the evolution of humans, over the last 50 years, we have come from a party line telephone, which was a telephone on the wall that we would pick up and ask somebody to put me through to somebody else and we could talk on the phone to now where I have in my pocket a phone that I can look up any information in the world. I can communicate with anybody in the world. I can see pictures from people in Russia that are friends, and I can see them in real time, meaning right now. That has been in the last 50 years. Humans have been developing and evolving for thousands of years. So to think that the human evolution is keeping up with the pace of social evolution, we are not. We are still way back trying to discover our physical beings in this new environment. It will take generations for humans to actually evolve physically, emotionally into this new world. And that is why this connection to nature is so important. It gives our children that anthropological breathing space. That means that all those needs that they have deep inside from our evolutionary growth as humans can be fulfilled in nature. They feel connected to something that their body, their evolutionary body understands. So this, this idea of the anthropological child really needs to be part of who you are as a teacher to be thinking about your children in that way. What is the natural need they are seeking when their behavior is this? In the world 21st century, and we look forward to our world, this concept of executive functions keeps coming up in, in business world. They are looking for a young person who has all the skills to be able to accomplish all the tasks that we are going to ask of them in the 22nd and 23rd centuries. So what are the skills that our children need? They need to be, a, they need inhibition. And that is the ability to control one's own thoughts and actions. To be able to be in charge of themselves, to be responsible. They need to be able to move from one activity to another. The ability to go with the flow, in other words, to kind of let things happen and go along with them rather than be obstinate with everything. To be relaxed about the world around them. Emotional control. To be able to control one's emotions and not allow my emotions to affect what is going on around me. Not allow my emotions to affect others in a negative way. Emotional control. Initiation. To be able to start something. Writer's block. How do I start? You put the pen on the paper and you write a word. To be able to start something. Working memory. To be able to take one objective or one 
thing that I've learned and then move to another task and bring that that idea, that thought, that skill with me to the new task and keep building on these new tasks by build, by taking your skills from one to the next and keep building your working memory. Planning and organizing. To be able to have everything you need. I've got to do my work. I need to make sure that I have everything that I need available to me. This presentation that I'm doing, I needed to make sure I had the PowerPoint. I had my computer. I had the time. I'm comfortable. I have everything that I need to be able to accomplish. Organization of materials. Having everything, I've got my pen, I've got my paper, I've got my notes, everything that I need to accomplish what I need to do. And then self-monitoring, taking care of myself, making sure that if I'm turning up for work, I'm appropriately dressed, that I already have my coffee before I start work, that I am ready to take on the task of the day. These are all executive functions. And when we think about education and teaching our children, these are the skills that they will need to go into the 22nd, 21st century. All of these. These can all be obtained in nature and the natural environment. So how do we do that? What are things that are going to support these executive functions by using the out of doors, by using nature? You need to provide as many sensory experiences as possible. Sensory experiences of touch, of smell, of hearing, of feeling. All your senses need to be able to be enlivened. So as many sensory experiences as possible. You need to create spaces for discovery. We talked about discovery, this idea that the child can discover. They're using their brain to discover it for themselves, not being told what to do. So you, in the environment, in nature, allowing them to explore and discover, see what's in the creek, see what's under the log, see what's around the other side of that Scrub, allowing them to discover creates executive functions. They need something to talk about. They need to tell their own story. They need to be able to have things that they own, not what their parents own, not what the teacher owns, but their own story. This develops communication skills. This develops creative skills and allowing them in an environment to have those adventures gives them something to talk about. Encourage gardening, digging in the dirt, being able to grow something from a seed, to be able to eat what they have grown, the connection to commerce, to be able to grow tomatoes, or basil, or pumpkin, and then to sell those items. The understanding of the value of money in connection to the work that they do. This is another part of those executive functions. They need physical challenges. They need to be able to use their whole body to be able to lift rocks to roll logs, to jump, to skip, to hop, to stand upside down, to be able to run free, to climb. All these things allow them the physical challenges. Physical challenges allow the brain to take more information in as, as we are being physical, our blood and heart are pumping more our brain gets more nutrients, blood and oxygen, to allow it to be able to think more. So 
physical challenges. Constructive play. And I'll get into this a little bit later on. But allowing them to be able to inspire their own play. Not have play put out there for them. This is what you're going to do. Allow them to create their own play. Inspire constructive play. And these are some ways that you can do that. I noticed the subtitles are stopping, so I'm going now we're back on. Great. Here's some ways that you can do that. Making forts in special places. Find a spot where the children can build, build a fort, and I'll have a video later on to show you that. Playing hunting and gathering games. Once again, that anthropological connection. Shaping small worlds, building things in sand like hills and rivers and maybe making a farm out in the in the ground or making shapes with rocks. Developing friendships with animals, care for animals, connecting to an animal. This is extremely powerful for a young person. Animals do not judge. They are happy to listen to a child chatter on for hours. They don't comment. They don't say, mm, really, can you stop now? They just listen. Creating fantasies using their imagination. Following paths in the woods and figuring out shortcuts. How do I get from A to B in the quickest way? Or how do I go the longest way? And on and on. There are many, many different ways that they can develop in nature those executive functions that we just talked about. Nature is the perfect prepared environment for children. It does not demand of the child anything. It does not tell the child what to do. It does not ask of our children. It allows each and every child to see in nature their own perspective. It allows the child to be able to connect in a way that's personally theirs. Nobody else, not the adult, not another child, their own perception of the environment. It allows them to do what they are comfortable with doing. Nature is the perfect prepared environment for your child to learn, to use their gross motor skills, as well as use their fine motor skills. A little bit of um, research, and, and one of the nice things about the modern world is that we are now have access to a lot more research, and especially brain research, and to look at the brain. So this is attention restoration theory. Attention restoration theory predicts that when the student's brain interacts with nature, there is a shift in the brain's attention system. This shift towards relaxation restores the lost mental energy, allowing students to rest in green areas during breaks can rejuvenate them and improve their readiness to learn. Just giving students 10 minutes outside on the grass or connecting them to a plant inside the classroom or having them just be outside and look at the sky and the clouds, this is proven to restore the child's brain attention system. So if you're in the classroom and you're studying something big, think about how can I 
allow my children to reset their brain? What can I add to this? Can they quickly go outside and just stand in the grass for five minutes and then come back in? Or can I just fill the room with some greenery, put a flower on each of their desks, something from the natural environment to help them connect back to nature? Attention restoration theory, very important. Hygiene hypothesis holds that when exposure to parasites, bacteria, and viruses is limited early in life, children face a greater chance of having allergies, asthma, and other autoimmune diseases during adulthood. So I'll do that again. The hygiene hypothesis holds that when exposure to parasites, bacteria, and viruses is limited early in life, children face a greater chance of having allergies, asthma, and other autoimmune diseases during adulthood. Really important. Um, somebody needs to mute their uh, voice because I'm getting a lot of background. C'è qualcuno che ha il microfono acceso, dovete spegnerli i microfoni per favore, altrimenti c'è il conflitto di voci. Sentiamo delle voci. Chiudere i microfoni. Thank, thank you. Thank you. This was research done by a fellow by the name of Tom McDade. He's a PhD from Northwestern University. He says microbial exposure in early childhood, exposure to animal feces, and a child that has had more cases of diarrhea indicated that later in life, the adult would have less or no sign of inflammation of the gut, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. So what Tom's research said was our children who are connected to nature, who are exposed to the natural world in a very sensorial way, have played in the dirt, have hugged trees, have climbed trees, have been around animals, would have less signs of inflammation of the gut, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's. Our gut is such an important part of our immu immune system. That is why babies are very oral. They put things in their mouth all the time. And the reason they put things in their mouth is they're putting the environment inside their system to create an immune system to allow them to survive the environment of which they live in. They have to put their environment into their gut to build an immune system to allow them to survive the environment of which we live. The modern world with its sanitization and removal of children from the ground and putting them in containers, bassinets, strollers, and not allowing them to explore nature takes them away from this idea of putting their environment inside their bodies to build their immune system. For those that don't read English, this says, today's three-year-olds can switch on a laptop and open their favorite apps. Me, when I was three, I ate mud. Little amusement. Uh, as you know, Montessori is a very important part of um, uh, my educational philosophy and my connection to young children and how I view children uh, in the world. Uh, and Montessori wrote a number of things, and I want to share with you one of her quotes. Um, it says, but if for the physical life it is necessary to have the child exposed to the vivifying forces of nature, that's thunder, lightning, birth, death, growth, all those kind of things, vivifying forces of nature, 
it is also necessary for his physical life to place the soul of the child in contact with creation, birth, death, life, in order that he may lay up for himself treasure from the directly educating forces of living nature. In other words, to understand life by watching things grow. The method of arriving at this end is to set the child at agricultural labor. In other words, getting them outside to grow plants, to work in the garden, guiding him to the cultivation of plants and animals, and so to the intelligent contemplation of nature. If we allow children to connect to things that grow, to animals, to plants, then they will understand their own development, that there is life, there is death, there is growth. And just like a plant, we are born, we grow, and then we die. We have children, they have seedlings, just like the animal. So watching life around them connects them to their own lives. Montessori believed that there were several gradations or ideas that can be distinguished in using this idea of growing plants and animals, agriculture and animal care. One is the child's initiation into observation of the phenomenon of life. So in other words, this idea that the child gets to see death, animals die, just like humans die. It's an understanding that things have life and death and birth. The child is initiated into foresight by way of auto education. In other words, they're seeing it themselves. They're not being told this is happening. They're watching that little seed grow and they're getting auto education. When he knows that the life of the plant that he's been sown depends upon his care in watering them and that of the animals, upon his diligence in feeding them, without which the little plant dries up and the animals suffer hunger. The child becomes vigilant, focused, there as one who's beginning to feel a mission in life, connecting them to nature, watching them grow something, care for something, gives them that feeling of the mission in life because they will grow up to have their own children and to understand that their own children need the care that they gave the animal or the plant when they were a child. The children are initiated into the virtue of patience and into confident expectation, which is a form of faith and philosophy of life. Seed doesn't grow overnight. It takes time. So each day I come and water my plant and I watch it and it grows slowly and I become patient and I'm confident that it will grow and it will flower or that animal that I feed every day will stay healthy and happy or the garden that I plant, that I nurture, will eventually grow and give me the things that I love. The child is inspired with a feeling of nature, that connection of what I grow up to, to know, I will grow up to care for. What I grow up to love, I will grow up to care for and preserve. It follows the natural way of developing of the human race, very similar to birth, life, having children and death, following that natural way of development. So now down to the nitty gritty. These are the 10 dangerous things you should allow children to do. First, climb trees. Children are prevented from this experience by the modern world, not because they don't have access to trees, but because people perceive climbing trees to be dangerous. In actual fact, tree climbing is no more dangerous than walking down the street. Both require us to develop skills to do what we need to do to accomplish that goal. 
I can walk down the street and trip over and skin my knees. Just as easily as I can climb on a branch and slip. If I am diligent and I am focused and I am paying attention and I am developing my skills by taking risks, calculated risks, not risks that I do not understand or have the skills to be able to accomplish, but risks that I have slowly worked up to, I can successfully navigate walking down a street or climbing a tree. It gives the child a new perspective of the world, looking down on the world rather than looking up to the world. Children love to be in trees. It gives them a sense of independence, accomplishment. I've done something. Play with water and in water. Water is one of the most sensorial experiences children can have. When I say sensorial experiences, if you imagine putting your, your hands in a bucket of water, your whole body feels that. Your whole body is experiencing that. Most of you or some of you who have children know how difficult it is to get your children out of the bath. They're splashing around, they're playing, they want to play in the bathtub all night. It's because the water is so connected to us in a very sensorial way. So allowing children to connect to water is really, really important. Throw things. Children need to use their gross motor skills to be able to skip a rock on a creek or to be able to throw a stick way in front of them. Nowadays, when you watch young people, they cannot catch a ball. They cannot throw a ball properly. If you imagine the mechanics of throwing a tennis ball from one friend to another, there is an enormous amount of skill in that. Skill that comes from hand, eye, brain coordination. The hand connected to the eye, connected to the brain. I need to hold the tennis ball. I need to pull my arm back and I need to throw and I need to let go the ball at the exact right time so that it sails through the air into my friend's hands. That connection to the brain means that the brain knows exactly where the hand is. It knows exactly when to let the ball go. It takes practice. Why is this important? Because the brain connected the hand helps in writing skills. Without that connection of the hand and the fingers to the brain, writing is impossible. Drawing is impossible. So the more practice children have in connecting the hand to the brain and the feet to the brain, the stronger they will be at fine motor skills using writing skills and so forth. So throwing is very important. Play with fire. I'm not saying here's a box of matches, kids. Go out and burn something down. No. Fire is a once again that connection to the primeval or the anthropological child. Without fire, humans would never have survived. We would have gone away with the dinosaurs. Fire is also the place where people gathered to tell stories to give the oral history of their people. Fire is the place they cooked the meal every day. Fire is the thing that kept them warm on a cold night. Fire is the thing that kept wild animals away. It is part of our DNA. 
So allowing children to build a small fire, to maybe cook something on it, connects them very sensorial to who we are anthropologically. Just imagine yourself sitting next to a fire. We tend to get mesmerized. We stare into the flame and our mind relaxes. Cook with real equipment. Once again, we tend to think that our children cannot use or do things adults do. Children are very capable. As long as we give them the appropriate tools and we give them the time and we give them the lessons, then they can do the things that they need to do. Cook with real equipment. Garden, dig holes using a shovel and a hoe and a rake. The toy industry was very smart. In the 1970s, the toy industry discovered, which we knew way before that, that children love to do what adults do. They love to mimic adults. So the toy industry created tons of plastic replicas of adults' tools, plastic saws, plastic hammers, plastic lawn mowers, plastic ovens, all this stuff that looked like what adult was using, but the child could never use it like an adult. So the toy industry was saying to the child, you can have something that looks like it, but we don't trust you with the real thing. In other words, it was convinced that our children were useless. They didn't have the capacity to be able to have knowledge and understanding and to be able to learn to use equipment. We should be giving our children real tools. You imagine the child trying to saw a piece of wood with a plastic saw or hammer a nail with a plastic hammer? Our children need real tools. They need an adult to take the time to teach them and to guide them and then allow them to do it for themselves. Build things with a hammer and nail, real things, building a fort, constructing a birdhouse, building a little place for their puppy dog to play. Anything to be able to build things gives them a feeling of accomplishment, achievement. Freedom to explore on their own, to be able to do things under their own time, their own experience. Run free in the woods, run free in the meadow, unencumbered, ready to just go out into the world and enjoy the freedom that they have. And then the last dangerous thing that you should allow your children to do is whatever you think will give your child, your children, the experiences that they need to be able to develop. All of this creates what I call the caution meter. This is that little thing inside our head that tells us, stop, don't put your hand on the hot plate, it will burn. Stop, don't take another step, you'll go over the cliff. Or as a child, when I was running through the long grass in Australia, I stopped before putting my foot on that snake and getting bit. This is what I mean by the caution meter. And the caution meter is only developed when a child can do all the things that they need to do by themselves on their own terms to create their own inner caution meter. What can we do as adults? What, what are the things that allow us to be able to help our children? The first and most important is you have to be a role model. You have to be the leader. You have to be comfortable with nature. You're the one that they're going to copy. And if you are squirmish about bugs, 
and you don't like trees and nature is something that you have no connection to, please don't take children out in nature because they will grow up in the same way. You have to go out and you have to start to develop your own nature sense. Find yourself a hero, somebody that you look up to. Rachel Carson, who wrote uh, a number of books, one, The Sense of Wonder, is one of my heroes. And she was a wonderful person for understanding and connecting to nature. You need to have a role model that you can feel, I want to be like that person. So this is what I need to do. Because when you go out with your children and you are comfortable in nature, they will also relax and be comfortable in nature. You are the first step and the most important step. Care for animals. The value of connecting children to animals is really important. Our classrooms in our school have dogs in them every day. There's a dog in each of the classrooms every day. These animals that you see here are at our school and the children look after them every day. This is part of what they do. It's part of their their work. So connecting them to animals. I'm going to show you a quick video of our students. These are our younger students. This is a group of three to six year old students. And they are in a classroom and they have come down to the creek to let go a um, crayfish that one of the students had found at home. So you can just see right there in the middle, the student who's letting go that crayfish. This is what we have our kids do all the time, connecting them to things in nature. This child who's releasing this crayfish has now developed purposefulness. I have a job to do. All the other children are crowding around to see this crayfish be release, released back into the pond. This is our middle school kids. And every day they have to go out onto the farm and feed the animals. The temperature on the farm this day was about minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is in Celsius, but it's very cold. And as you can see, there's snow and everything around. But the purposefulness of these children is that they need to feed the animals. If they don't look after the animals when it's cold like this and there's no feed, the animals will die. And there's a whole lot of animals that they need to feed to make sure that they survive. Connecting to nature, to natural environments, takes many different kinds of acts. And this is a view of our, our farm at our school that we've developed to connect children to agriculture. But nature is connects in many different ways. This is another group of young people, and the simplicity of this is incredible. So these students are creating music. We did not tell them what to do. We did not give them any materials. All we did was walk down to this pile of logs and stood back and allowed them to do whatever they wanted. Allowed them the time, the freedom and the space to be able to create their own adventures. So I'm going to scooch back again. I want to show you these lads here started to create music all on their own. As you can see the dog in the background, he spends time in that classroom. But they on their own, under their own steam, found things to make music with. 
And there's another group of students there discovering in other spots and doing other things. So just allowing them the freedom to be able to do things on their own. Here's another simple activity for students. Rolling down the hill. Once again, we did not tell the children to roll down the hill. They ran up and decided this is what they wanted to do. It may not be every child wanting to roll down. One child might run up the hill and start to roll. And then another child sees that happening and go, I want to do that too. And then before you know it, all the children are running down and rolling down the hills. You just need to allow them the space to discover the things that they wanted to do. I We did not go out with the, con, with the idea of today we're going to roll down a hill. We went for a walk and the children decide what they want to do. And they decided to roll down the hill. So giving the children the freedom to be able to do those experiences is quintessential to their development. Lots of fun. The work we can do with children in the out of doors. Encourage gardening, which I've talked about. These are our gardens at our school. And the reason I showed you this is because you can build these anywhere. Now, you can see this is on ground, but these boxes actually are fully self-contained. In other words, I could pick them up if I was strong and move them because there's a base to them. They're full of soil and they could be anywhere. They could be actually on concrete and they would still grow. So we create square boxes in our big garden because this gives the child without the adult saying so, a boundary of the garden. You don't walk inside the box. You walk around the box. I can reach from one side of the box into the middle. If I wanna go and get something on the other side, I walk around the box, then I can reach in from that side. Without the adult telling children, they innately understand how the box works and what they need to do to be able to navigate in the garden. So you're limiting what you have to tell children for them to be successful. You're allowing them to auto-educate, which Montessori talked about earlier on, to discover for themselves. It's another view of that garden for them to be able to discover. Focus on the senses. For many of us, you may not have great skills in the outdoors. You may not know a lot about nature, but all of us know a lot about our senses. We live with them every day. Sight, smell, touch, hearing, taste. Each one of these senses we can use as an adventure for children in nature. Take them outside and have them think about what they're seeing. Have a child, two children, one child blindfolded with a blindfold around their eyes so they can't see. Have the other child take them on a little tour, a little walk, no talking. Take them to a tree in amongst lots of other trees. Allow the child who is blindfolded to feel that tree, feel it all over. Then the other child takes that child back and then you take the blindfold off and that child then has to go and find that tree using their sense of touch. What did it feel like? Where were its branches? What was the ground like? How far did it seem to be away? So connecting the lack of sight with the sense of touch brings two senses together. Having children smelling herbs and grasses and, and things in nature 
using their sense of smell. We're going to take a hike today and we're going to use just our sense of smell to discover things. Give them each a wet sponge. Allow them to wet their nose with the sponge. When you have a wet nose, your sense of smell is heightened. That's why a dog has a wet nose. It heightens their sense of smell. So pop the wet sponge on their nose and have them walk through an environment, picking up the smells. Hearing, having them quiet themselves and listen. Listen. What are the sounds? In the first part, you will hear the plane, the car, and the, so the, 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 the noise of, of humanity. But once you quieten yourself, and take the time, you can hear through humanity. And even younger children, two and three and four year olds, can hear the world beyond. The bird, the rustling of the wind in the leaves, the connection of the sounds of nature. This idea of taste. What are things in nature taste like? Making sure they're not tasting poisonous plants, but there are plenty, plenty of plants that are edible that children can taste. Take them on a taste sensation of the environment. These are things that you also need to be comfortable with. You need to be the one tasting because if you do it, they'll do it. So focus on the senses as you go out in the environment. Tell stories, especially stories about nature. Remember we talked about the fire brought people together to tell the oral history of their community. Children need stories and they need stories that are about natural nature themes, natural themes. And enjoying telling stories about animals and plants in our natural world. And you can tell the same story for especially for the younger ones. Over and over again. Finding peace and silence. This is really important. Our children have very little opportunity to be quiet in the modern world. And we call this activity the listening point. It's about the spiritual human connection to the environment. Sigurd Olson, a famous envi environmentalist here in the United States said, each time I have gone there, to his listening point, his quiet place, I have found something new, which has opened up a great realm of thought and interest. For me, it has been a point of discovery and, like all such places of departure, has assumed meaning far beyond the ordinary. In the same way, when the child listens quietly and hears through the noise of the car and the plane, to the sound of the bird, to the sound of the wind rustling in the leaves. They are listening through beyond the ordinary. This is critical for every time you go out in nature. Allowing children to sit quietly by themselves, just a few feet apart. For younger ones, 10 minutes. For middle school and high school, half an hour to an hour just to be quiet, to quieten their body, quieten themselves, and enjoy the natural environment on its terms, where nothing else is going on except me sitting quietly, enjoying the natural environment. Play in nature is critical. For every child who has an opportunity to play in nature, they also have the opportunity to discover a lot about themselves. These were traditional playgrounds. Large mental objects and these kinds of playgrounds that were built by adults for children. Created bullying, created dangerous environments. They also limited what a child could do with them because they were constructed for single purposes. 
what we really should be doing is creating environments where children can create their own play. This video is a video of our playground at our school. This is a group of 30 three to six year olds who are playing in their playground at the school. As you can see, there's no play equipment. There's no we constructed. All of the things you see are built and constructed by the children. A simple pile of dirt, a pile of rocks, branches, sticks, leaves, pathways, just open space. All of these children have been in this play space for an hour and a half when this video was taken. None of them are bored. None of them are saying, I have nothing to do. There are 30 children here after an hour and a half still completely engaged in play. But reality is they're not playing, they're learning, they're developing their skills, they're working. Remember way back at the beginning, I said play is actually about working and they prefer to work. They have objectives. They're building things. They're creating things. They're doing everything that they need. You'll also notice there are no adults in this area. The adults are standing way back off, just relaxing, doing their own thing, because the children are completely safe doing what they need to do in an environment that they have created. We have given them boundaries. They know those boundaries. And those boundaries are big and wide. They are in eyes and ears of an adult at all times. So the adult can see them or hear them at all times. There is nothing dangerous here because all of the children are skilled at this environment because they play in it every single day. Many school, schools spend enormous amounts of money on play equipment. We spent nothing. And yet I would tell you that our children are way more engaged in our playground then you would find children engaged in a constructed by adults playground. Adults have no place in children's play because they take away the experiences of the child. This is our um, older kids playground. I talked about building forts. This is something that they have constructed themselves by going into the woods and collecting sticks and logs and dirt to build their own fort. And they, once again, will play for hours because this is their space. This is not the adult space. This is not somebody else's space. This is their space. It is all of theirs. And they work together as a group to enjoy being in that space. Sorry. I'm killing the sound because the sound uh, plays around with the um, translation at the bottom. Once again, this is the, the kind of the entrance to the fort. And each child can kind of do their own thing within that environment. And there's the puppy dog that they all have in their classroom. She gets around to visit everybody. 
um, chasing sticks. Once again, you see a lot of freedom and doing their own thing. Nature and play are all about loose parts. So it's that human need to control nature versus nature's need for freedom and randomness. Loose parts are in all of our playgrounds. All those videos that I showed you, nothing constructed. It's all bits and pieces that children can put together. These are a couple of photos of um, playgrounds in more urban areas. Um, this one is of uh, somebody has taken uh, drainage pipes and put them together so children can pour water and see how water works around. This is in some ways very open ended. They can construct their own flow of water and creeks with those. This one is just a lot of random bits and pieces that the children can build with stones and rocks, sticks and logs uh, in a small space. And that's kind of uh, for some schools, they only have a small space to be able to create. This is an idea where they used a small space and they've created baskets of natural things the students can then go and gather and take and play with. Um, this would be in a very urban environment, but still having access to some natural things. So another thing that you can do with children, and we've done this with the very younger children and much older children, is expressing art in nature. I'm going to get rid of the sound here as well. So the video that I am showing you is a video of a artist called Andy Goldsworthy, and he creates in nature natural art. And the concept is to create a natural piece of art that lasts only a very short period of time. And it's built with the materials in the natural environment. And this piece that you're looking at right now, he's building in the winter um, and he's very skilled. But as you can see, it's a beautiful piece. And as the sun comes up, that piece will melt and disappear. So building and creating in nature, but understanding it will only last a very short period of time. This piece he's building on a river that is tidal. In other words, the tides come in and ultimately the tide will take this piece of art away. Um, taking natural objects and building with them. These are some of the art the children built. So you can see they've taken things from nature and built beautiful pieces of art. Any age can do this. Our three, four and five year olds do this as well. They need to be able to be inspired. And you can show them pictures. They're available online of work from Andy Goldsworthy. Maybe take a few of those pictures and print them and take them with you to give the children some ideas to start with. Then they can start to create on their own. And this is connecting beauty of human eye to what's going on in the natural environment. And these are some beautiful pieces that have been created by uh, students. All different ages, lots of different ideas, using different materials that they've found out in the environment. This piece I think is really beautiful. The child has broken each rock to create that middle circle. This is done, these are done by three, four and five year olds. If we go back, these are done by three and they're masks made out of leaves and sticks and, and the children have so much fun with this creating. Another one of just rocks and flowers. This fellow's name, Andy Goldsworthy. Um, that's his name that you can um, copy down. So you are going to get an opportunity to go out 
into um, a natural environment tomorrow and to look around and kind of work out what can I do when I go out in nature? Um, so there are many, many things that you can do. The very first thing that you need to focus on tomorrow is you need to focus on yourself. You need to start to think about how comfortable am I now that I am out here in the environment? How free do I feel to go wherever I want? What is constraining me? Am I encumbered? And what I mean by the word encumbered, I mean, am I wearing clothing that I don't want to get dirty? Am I wearing shoes that are making my feet wet and uncomfortable? Am I, is the sun too bright and I'm not wearing a hat? Do I have my cell phone on, which keeps binging to tell me that I have a message that distracts me? Am I prepared to immerse myself in nature fully 100%? Can I sit on the ground for a while and feel totally comfortable and not concerned about a bug or dirt or anything else? Am I warm? Am I dry? What is the weather? Do I have everything that I need? A bottle of water in case I get thirsty. Am I carrying things in my hand? If I have things in my hand, then I can't pick anything up. I have to put things down to pick something up. You need your hands to be free. So you have to wear a, a, a fanny pack or a butt pack or a backpack. Everything you need is in that. Your hands are completely free to explore the round. We get many of our sensorial experiences through our hands. So you need to take care of yourself. Your dress. All of the things that to make you completely comfortable when you're out in the environment. The second thing that you might want to do is to start thinking about the senses and start trying to do some activities just with your senses. If you are with other people and they are disturbing you, then you need to move your body somewhere where they're not disturbing you. And the language that you use when you use when you talk to children should be in the same way. Move your body where you are not being disturbed by somebody else. Because that is not judgmental in any way. It's not mean in any way. It just means I need to move my body somewhere where I'm more comfortable. So thinking about the senses, if you want to find a quiet spot, go and find a quiet spot. If you want to use your sense of smell, bring along that wet rag or that wet cloth that you can use. If you want to uh, do some, your sense of not having sight, have somebody put a blindfold on you and then navigate you around and do that activity about feeling the tree. Take a story with you that you can sit and read, a story that is about nature, a children's book or an adult book, something that you're in nature, but you're also connecting to a story. Journal writing, being able to draw in nature, to be able to write something down, to be able to create, maybe do some of Andy Goldsworthy's creations. All of those things that we talked about are things that can occupy your time for hours in the natural world. If you are finding yourself, I'm bored, I don't know what to do, you are holding yourself in. You need to breathe, go and find a spot by yourself, sit down and just look around. 
Your mind will then start, it may take a little while, but your mind will then start to be inquisitive about what you are seeing. Hmm, that's a really cool tree. I like that tree. I wonder what it's like to feel. And then you'll get up and you'll go and feel that tree. And when you're looking at that tree and feeling it, you notice a bird's nest. Or you notice a log lying on the ground that might be cool if you roll it over and see what's underneath it. That may lead you to another animal, a rabbit that you happen to see on the edge of a verge. Um, Thank you. So each one of these experiences will lead you to the next. But to start, if you're wondering what to do, start with silence, start with quietness, start with visual, and that will lead you to the next level of um, experiences. Write out when you're in, the, in your environment, write out or draw out some of your experiences, because those collective writings will help you later when you're taking children out because you can sit and read them and go, yes, I remember this experience. This was really powerful for me. How am I going to do that for my children? How do I make that feeling that I had, how do I make that for my children? How do I give them that experience? It'll allow you to pull yourself back to those experiences so that then those experiences can then give you the experience you need to give to your children. Climb a tree. Enjoy climbing a tree. Don't climb beyond your own skill level, but take a little risk. If you don't take risk, you will never discover. If you don't take risks, you'll never discover. Nothing was ever created by somebody who did not take risks. So risk taking is really important. Push yourself a little bit. Step out of your comfort zone because you're going to be asking your children to step out of their comfort zone. All of these things have to do with you feeling comfortable and connected yourself and then allowing your children the freedom. So right back at the very beginning, we talked about allowing the freedom. We want to have we want to give children awareness. We want to create a positive attitude about nature. We want to give them knowledge of natural systems. We want to give them the skills <clears throat> that they can be in nature and are comfortable in nature. And we want them to participate. Awareness. Attitude. Knowledge. Skills and participation. All of these things will lead us to creating a long term child who loves and is connected to the natural world. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a second to maybe if you have any questions, there's a lot of material that I went through. Um, it's now getting about 10 minutes before we are completed. Um, if you take a snapshot of this URL, there are about 10, 15 videos at this URL that I put together at the beginning of the pandemic that teaches children about animals on the farm and about things in nature. And you may get some information out of here on here on uh, some fun things that you could do with your children. Uh, they are, they're a YouTube, it's a YouTube channel but there are probably maybe 15, 16 short 10 minute videos. Uh, they would also be fun for your children to watch. Unfortunately, they are in English. Um, so you may just do the visuals because they're kind of fun to watch. It's all of our animals on the farm. And then one of our staff working in the Redwoods in California and talking about nature. So. Sandra, how should we go about if people have questions? I'm going to un Yes, I'm going to leave. I, think, I, I think there is a one question. 
Maria Bellissima, you want Maria Antonietta, do you want to say something, please? Sì, sì, volevo più che una domanda, volevo intanto fare i complimenti al professore perché ha trattato temi molto importanti e volevo dire che quest'ultima parte, soprattutto della consapevolezza, è una cosa che ci dicono di fare anche noi adulti quando siamo magari sotto stress o sotto insomma o soffriamo di attacchi d'ansia ci sono proprio degli studi che, che dicono di fare tipo mindfulness di respirare di, di insomma di sentire la natura di abbandonare la mente di essere consapevoli quindi mi viene da pensare se già tutte queste cose si fanno da bambini potremmo evitare da adulti tanti tanti malesseri Okay, there is no question, Geoffrey, it's just a comment about, okay. about the, the point that um, we, need, we need to have this relaxing space, a place where we can, are free, where we have a silence around, because in this way our stress will go down and we will uh, have energy for the rest of the day or for the week. So usually um, uh, uh, adults have this, um, this experience of uh, very pressing life, um, uh, too many things to do, too many things to think about, and there are uh, theories about um, how to uh, get energy from nature. So she said that if uh, this is important for adults, we can figure that for children, if they start to have this kind of rela relation with nature, they will help themselves once they grow up, have this very frenetic life. Mm -hmm. That's very, very true. It's, it, it's really the basis of everything that I've been talking about, is that, that connection to relax and enjoy, that's when the learning really happens. Yes, it's true. So we can, we can, I think we can have this experience tomorrow uh, because it's easy, but once we learn our, ourselves the um, very important uh, um, uh, meaning of being uh, connected with nature, starting from our own feeling, uh, our own experience, it would be easier to propose the same thing to children. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, uh, absolutely correct. So first, uh, our first experience means uh, to understand the importance of the fact. Mm -hmm. Ok, Ade, eh, ci sono altre domande? Eh, io penso che um, abbiamo avuto moltissime suggestioni. Um, Geoffrey, the link you are showing us, uh, um, the YouTube connection you, you have in this slide, um, mm -hmm. uh, provide for a list of uh, things to do or, or what, or what does it mean? Is a, um, this, 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 this vid the videos that are here is just a little extra. It's just kind of fun videos that you can so show your children or you oh, can okay. see. Okay. That they're really not a list of things to do in nature, although there are activities in there that you can teach children and there are things that help your knowledge um, okay. to understand natural uh things but it once again it is english and no no it subject. doesn't matter it's, even though you don't understand english you see the you see the scenery and you can gather the meaning yeah yeah yes yeah, yeah i don't think it's important to know to know english yeah. as, as you showed before uh, from the for the picture we had from the video you show us it was very um, easy to connect uh, um, the situation and to understand how children could play freely in the environment. So the, the contrast with the place where you are a lot of equipment 
with a place where you have nothing is very important because in our situation, teacher tends to give uh, equipment. What I have to bring with me <laughs> to, 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 um, to pass three hours outside. So they worry for things which should not be planned before going to the open space. So yeah, open uh, space, can I just can I just add something on that point, which is really important? Um, if you are taking children out to the environment, if you take them out the first time for three hours, it will be a disaster. They cannot, they, they, they don't have the capacity to fill three hours. So you start with the first time we go for maybe 20 minutes, then the next time, 40 minutes. Then the next time, an hour. You need to slowly build on that because they do not have the capacity to fill in that amount of time the very first time. It is, you have to slowly build up. Ultimately, you're going to get to a point where you could be out there for days. But to start with, it needs to be very short. And then you need to build on that. You longer, see, yes, yes, I understand, Geoffrey, but this is uh, quite impossible in our situation. I, 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 um, I show you what, what is our reality. Uh, we must bring uh, children to a place like Crea, the one, the place where we are going tomorrow, and uh, we have a, we are a, a, we have a bus for this. So. Yeah. Not leave there 20 minutes and go back to school because it's too far away. So right. we we are not allowed to have a 20 minutes one day, 40 minutes. So what, so what I would suggest is that you bring activities uh, that you can do. Give them 20 minutes the first time or a little bit of time watching how they're experiencing. Then add on activities and then next time make it a little longer. Ultimately, you want to get get to the point where they are free for the whole time. Okay. But you you will need to bring some things for them to do because they just don't for the first time they don't have the capacity to create that that in the amount of time that much. They they may because it may be really exciting environment, but in our experience, you've got to build up to it over time. Okay, Laura, please. Yes, I uh, would like to thank uh, Mr. Bishop for your contribution and I'm really, I agree with you for all you say. Uh, the thing we, I, we are facing here in Italy, in my experience, uh, are twice parents and urbanization. Uh, for the first, I can, I can report uh, once uh, we went in a in, uh, in the wild uh, with trees, when we come back, the parents said, what, what 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 are you do? Just just see go and see the trees and what what you uh, really understand? Why do we have to spend some money to to make this this experience? That's what's once. Mm -hmm. And um, for urbanization uh, uh, in the classroom, when sometimes uh, a fly comes in through the windows uh, there's or a spider a little little spider there's panic uh, throughout the classroom because uh, <laughs> even the child the children don't want to sit down on the ground because it's dirty uh, it's very really uh, uh, um, a, a situation it's very difficult so uh, I think that 20 minutes is uh, uh, too much, <laughs> even too much, but we have a goal. So we have to make it uh, not once in uh, a time, but in years. That's just so what I want to say. I think you, I think you, what you are saying is, is very important. And many, many communities are suffering this. So um, what I suggest is, for example, if an insect comes to the classroom, you need to think about that as a teachable moment. And you need to set up in your classroom that uh, if something happens, whatever, everyone can get quiet because that spider, you can then tell the story of the spider. 
And I think once the kids learn about a creature and they can connect to that creature's life, most kids think the spiders are going to bite you. The reality is very few spiders have the capacity to bite and even fewer have the capacity to harm. But everyone thinks every spider is deadly, so they're terrified of spiders. They're terrified of insects. We as uh, adults have to start to teach them that these insects are really important to the world. And every, every insect, every plant has a place. And it's our job to understand them like we understand the other kids in our classroom to be able to move on. It's big work. This is huge work now because we've come way too far to the other side. Yes. Where nobody is connected to anything. We have to pull back. And the only way we do that is one child at a time. We, we it's, it's huge work. Don't yes. think it's not big work. It's huge work. And it's everywhere, not just in Italy. It's here in the United States. It's in Australia. It's in many places where our kids are completely withdrawn from the natural world. 